evening all on behalf of waa i feel privileged and immense joy as well as exaltation to extend my warm welcome to each and every one present here in this evening we are happy to see you all here together many of you have made a huge endeavor to join us today on behalf of our waa we are deeply appreciative and offer you our most grateful welcome we assure you will have a great time and will enjoy the cornelia sorabji lecture series since our honorable judge accepted to grace with his presence to enlighten us regarding inherent powers its extent and limitation யாமறிந்த மொழிகளிலே தமிழ் மொழி போல் இனிதாவது எங்கும் காணும் எனும் பாரதியாரின் கூற்றுக்கிணங்க நமது தாய்மொழியாகிய தமிழை வணங்க அனைவரும் எழுமாறு தாழ்மையுடன் கேட்டுக்கொள்கிறேன் வாழ்த்து தெக்கணமும் அதிர்ச்சிறந்த திராவிடன திருநாடும் தக்க சிறு பிறை நுதலும் தரித்தனரும் திலகமுமே அத்திலக வாசனை போல் அனைத்துலகும் இன்பமுற எத்திசையும் புகழ் மணக்க இருந்த பெரும் தமிழனங்கே தமிழ்தாய் வாழ்த்துக்கு நன்றி a good company a good wine a good welcome can make a good people may now request one of the frontier women of our association mrs anandavalli madam our president to deliver a warm welcome address happy evening to all of you as the president of women advocate association i am wishing you all a very happy new year it is an absolute pressure to welcome you all in this new week of the year with the cornelia sorabji lecture series in fact this is not our first lecture series in different sessions and in different occasions our association used to conduct a lot of lecture series to enlighten educate and empower the advocates it all stopped on march 2020 because of the great pandemic i am glad to tell you that we are resuming this lecture series after two long years for this i very heartily want to thank honorable dr justice g chaitendran who has agreed to break the barrier by accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture on indian powers it extends and limitations our justice has an immense knowledge in the field of law which could be seen from the judgments delivered by our justice Our justice has obtained his doctorate in trafficking and control of narcotics drugs in India and his analytical skills while delivering the judgments can be evidently seen by his explanation in the judgment itself with his lordship's of profound knowledge i hope this lecture definitely going to be a landmark in the lecture series of our association i welcome your lordship once again i welcome honorable mr justice sundar mohan honorable mr justice yen mala for this great occasion I welcome Mr. Shrinivas Raghavan, President MBA, Mr. P. Andiraj, President MBA CA, and Secretaries Mr. Vengadeshan, MBA, Mr. Anbaras, MBA CA, and Senior Advocate Mr. Isaac Mohanlal, Mr. S. N. Krishnaveni, and all advocates who are present here by accepting our invitations through WhatsApp and in person. Really, I have to welcome all my women advocates who are present here. in spite of their picking up their children at 5:30 for to listen this lecture series in this association i welcome all my friends mr samudray i welcome very special welcome to him because he and mr alagram jodi always be the backbone of our association and i am happy to inform you that mr samudray also has taken the first initiative for, for this year after our after my acting as second time as president of waa to donate some books to our association i welcome mr samudurai 
I welcome you one and all for this grand occasion. Thank you one and all. No person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been rewarded for what he gave. With an object of imparting quality of legal acumen to the members of bar, especially to the young members of WAA, has been organizing this Kolonia Sarabji lecture series regularly. Many of our judges graced us with their presence and delivered a wonderful and intellectual speeches. It is our privilege to have one of our eminent judge, Honorable Justice Dr. Mr. G. Jaichandran, who is known for his academic excellence in various fields of law. His Lordship Ayana Matter is Madras University as well as National University of Advanced Legal Studies, Kochi. His law career under eminent presence after pursuing it, he established a law firm, Norton and Grant. From an established law firm, Norton and Grant, we had the benefit of his lordship to be the judge of this court. His curriculum vitae shows how blessed we are to present here for his lordship lecture series. May I now request Honorable Justice Dr. Mr. G. Jayachandra to enlighten us regarding inherent powers, its limitation and its extension. உங்கள் அனைவருக்கும் இனிய புத்தாண்டு வாழ்த்துக்கள் இனிய மாலை வணக்கங்கள் கார்னிலியா சுவராஜி நினைவு சொற்பொழிவு ஆற்றுவதற்காக மகளிர் வழக்கறிஞர்கள் மன்ற தலைவர் தலைவி அவர்கள் என்னை சந்தித்து அழைத்தபோது நான் உடனடியாக சம்மதம் தெரிவித்தேன் ஒரு உந்துதலின் பேரில் இந்த தலைப்பை என் தேர்ந்தெடுத்துக் கொண்டேன் இந்த விழாவினை ஏற்பாடு செய்திருப்பது மகளிர் வழக்கறிஞர்கள் சங்கம் விழா அரங்கம் ஆனி சாண்டே அரங்கம் இந்த நிகழ்வு கார்னிலியா சுவராஜியின் நினைவு சொற்பொழிவு இவற்றுக்கெல்லாம் ஒரு சம்பந்தம் இருக்கின்றது இதற்கு நான் ஏன் பேச அழைத்தேன் என்பதற்கு மட்டும் எனக்கு விடை கிடைக்கவில்லை சகோதரி மாலா அவர்களை அழைத்திருக்கலாம் அல்லது வேறு யாராவது அழைத்திருக்கலாம் இருப்பினும் நானாக ஒரு காரணத்தை கற்பித்துக் கொண்டிருக்கிறேன் அந்த காரணம் என்ன என்று என்னுடைய பேச்சின் இறுதியிலே சொல்லுகின்றேன் இந்த தலைப்பிற்கும் இந்த நினைவு சொற்பொழிவுக்கும் என்ன சம்பந்தம் இருக்கிறது என்று யோசித்து பார்த்தால் அதற்கும் சம்பந்தம் இருப்பதாக எனக்கு தோன்றுகிறது என்ற பெண்மணி இன்றைக்கு அவருடைய சுயசரிதையை படித்தாலோ அல்லது அவரை பற்றி நாம் படிக்கின்ற பொழுதோ சற்று சாதாரணமாக தோன்றலாம் ஆனால் எட்டு உடன்பிறப்புகளோடு பிறந்தவர் பார்சிக இனத்தை சார்ந்தவர் கிறிஸ்துவ மதத்தை தந்தையார் பற்றி கொண்டார் தாயார் முற்போக்கு சிந்தனை கொண்டவர் பெண்களை எல்லாம் நன்றாக படிக்க வைக்க வேண்டும் ஆசை கொண்டவர் அதற்கு ஏற்ப குழந்தைகளும் நன்றாக படித்தார்கள் ஆனால் கல்லூரியிலே சேர்வதற்கு தடை அவர்தான் இந்தியாவின் முதல் பட்டதாரி அவர் இந்தியாவில் இருந்து ஆக்ஸ்போர்டுக்கு சென்று சட்டம் பயின்ற முதல் பெண் பட்டதாரி அங்கு சென்ற போது கூட அவருக்கு தடை இருந்தது சில வருடங்கள் ஆயிரத்தி எட்நூற்றி எண்பத்தி ஏழு எண்பத்தி ஒன்பதுகளிலே அங்கு சென்றவர் ஆயிரத்தி எட்நூற்றி தொண்ணூற்றி ரெண்டில் தான் படிப்பை முடிக்க முடிந்தது அங்கேயே சிலரின் நல்ல எண்ணம் அவர்களுடைய அந்த இன்னரன் பவர் அதை பிரகித்து அவருக்கு அங்கே படிப்பதற்கு அனுமதி வாங்கி தந்தார்கள் அதை முடித்துவிட்டு இந்தியாவுக்கு வந்து பேரிஸ்டர் ஆகலாம் என்று சொன்னால் இங்கே இருந்த தடையினாலே அலகாபாத் நீதிமன்றம் அந்த காலத்தில் எல்லாம் வழக்கறிஞர்களாக பதிவு செய்ய வேண்டும் என்றால் சீஃப் ஜஸ்டிஸ் கோர்ட்டுக்கு சென்று அவரை ஒருவர் முன்மொழிய வேண்டும் மற்றொருவர் வழிமொழிய வேண்டும் அவர் பெயரை ஏற்றுக்கொள்ள வேண்டும் அப்போதுதான் பாரில் சேர்த்துக் கொள்வார்கள் அப்படிப்பட்ட ஒரு சூழ்நிலையிலே இவர் பெயரை ஏற்றுக்கொள்ள வேண்டுமா வேண்டாமா என்ற பொழுது 
காஸ்டிங் ஓட் என்ற ஒரு ஓட்டில் தன்னுடைய நியமனம் நிராகரிக்கப்பட்டவர் அவர் அதுக்காக இருபது ஆண்டுகள் காத்திருந்தவர் அங்கே அந்த இன்னரன் பவர் மேலே நாட்டிலே வெள்ளைக்காரன் அவருக்கு ஆதரவாக பயன்படுத்திய அந்த இன்னரன் பவர் உள்நாட்டிலே பயன்படுத்தவில்லை அதை எதிராக பயன்படுத்தினார்கள் ஆக அதிகாரம் என்பது கமிஷனாகவும் இருக்கலாம் கமிஷனாகவும் இருக்கலாம் அது என்னுடைய சொற்பொழிலே சொல்லுகின்றேன் இந்த அம்மையாருக்கு அந்த இன்னரன் பவர் ஒரு இடத்திலே பிரயோகப்படுத்தப்பட்டது ஆதரவாக ஒரு இடத்திலே பிரயோகப்படுத்தப்பட்டது எதிராக என்ன ஆச்சரியம் என்றால் மேலை நாட்டிலே அவருக்கு ஆதரவாக பயன்படுத்தப்பட்ட அந்த அதிகாரம் மறுக்கப்பட்டது காரணம் அரசியல் என்றும் சொல்லலாம் அல்லது அன்றைய இருந்த மக்களினுடைய சிந்தனையாகவும் இருக்கலாம் அதற்கு நாம் இப்பொழுது செல்ல வேண்டாம் ஆனால் அந்த பெண்மணி பாரிஸ்டராக பதிவு செய்து இந்த ஆண்டு அப்படி நூறு ஆண்டுகள் நிறைவு பெறுகிறது அதுதான் இதில் ஒரு சிறப்பு இரண்டு ஆண்டுகள் சொற்பொழிவு நடத்தப்படவில்லை என்று சங்க தலைவர் அவர்கள் சொன்னார்கள் தவறில்லை இந்த நூற்றாண்டு விழாவை மிக அருமையாக கொண்டாடுங்கள் தொடர் சொற்பொழிவு நடத்துங்கள் All right. Let me go into the subject. I have given a brief intro about Karnalidhya Sarajji. And uh, as I said, she was the first graduate, Indian women graduate. She did her graduation in Bombay University. Then she went to Oxford. And in London, she got her uh, BCL. Bachelor of Civil Law degree and then she was not permitted to practice as a barrister in India when she came back here. She is described as a groundbreaking Indian lawyer who advocated for women in dire need. That is reflected in her achievement. If you go through her biography as well as autobiography, you can find that even as an assistant in a court, for women litigants she has almost helped 600 widow zamindaris who were deprived of their right and cheated by their relatives 600 zamindari uh, widows so that is her achievement but she is an unsung heroine that's another thing and in a nutshell in 1986 she got graduation she was the first indian woman at deccan college Bombay University and she went to London and her bust has been unveiled in the year 2002 at Oxford University campus uh, where the High Court of London is located. It's a rare achievement. It's a very rare achievement which she has been conferred. And as I said in 1999 she was refused admission in Allahabad High Court. but later in 1923 she was admitted and started practice later on she went to london and died in the year 1954 this much about the uh, person whom we are commemorating by conducting this uh, lecture now inner and power extend and limitation this expression extend and limitation i have used as synonymous and uh, i have my own reservation about the powers of the court especially invoking the inner and power which we are now often exercising and that's the reason why i when this topic was suggested to me i readily accepted because i want to make my own self introspection about this power instead of lecturing about what judgments have said in certain cases i thought that the genesis of has to be analyzed and to be discussed and we have reached a point now that indian judiciary is at crossroad we are put at a, a litmus test acid test whether we can rise up to the occasion if something happens like what happened in the early 70s in this country whether a bar members are ready to take up the challenge are you going to defend this constitution if such thing such crisis occurs and if something 
unwanted going to happen in this country in the name of inherent power or by any other uh, institution exceeding the limits prescribed under the constitution are we going to defend it or succumb to that pressure this is a challenge to the entire bar in this nation i don't know how much of us have realized this situation the scenario the uh, sign of trouble has started and uh, i am not cynical please i am not cynical and i i am not uh, just uh, terrorizing you saying such words but please members of the bar take it from me the nation depends on you and it's fine i don't want to use that expression but people like hr kanna is required people like malikiwala is required people like govind sir now then is required now take up this challenge get ready for that so why inherent power is given to the courts and what was the intention inherent power to the court is not new or special to our indian constitution or indian scenario it is available in all the world and in some country they sparingly use in some country they never use and in some country they use only their inherent power and the difference can be very well seen from their quality of judgment now the purpose of courts is to adjudicate disputes and render justice they cannot be any second thought over that we have to adjudicate the dispute and we have to render justice and now the problem is this dispute has to be decided based on the law or else we know what will be the consequence and these laws are enacted by the parliamentarians either in the parliament or assembly and many times the laws are not a full fledged composite complete law there always used to be some vacuum some gray area which has to be tinkered with and this tinkering is done by exercising the inherent power this is the only purpose or reason why inherent power is given under the constitution as well as in the other courts not more than that so the sub silencio in the legislation without offending the intention of the legislator but to meet the ends of justice and if the legislation is silent we have to supplement certain thing so that it gives a full fledged meaning to the legislation as well as to the purpose for which court exists and inherent powers embodied in the constitution as well as in the code of criminal procedure code and the civil procedure code is to do justice and undo wrong in the course of providing justice this is the bottom line bottom line of this power now we look at the, our constitution preamble it says we the people of india have resolved to secure to all its citizens social economic and political justice so why this word justice i am repeating or introducing now itself is that the inherent power wherever the legislation or constitution say, uh, speaks about inherent power it goes with the word justice either to meet the ends of justice or to achieve the justice or to prevent abuse of justice like that therefore we have to understand what is meant by justice the whole problem is when the power given to the court to meet the ends of justice we are not able to understand or we have not fully conceived what is meant by justice each one have our own idea this is what justice if you ask amitriya sen he says justice is one thing and if you ask somebody else he says justice is something else it's a rule of law whoever follows the rule of law is justice somebody say equity is justice somebody say social justice somebody say social justice of remedy x y z there are n number of justices and if we are not able to understand what is justice in a given case and we we cannot exercise our inherent power to meet that justice and here the problem arises here the problem arises and that is why there are some conflict of opinion 
and uh, it is now juris all over the world they say that this sort of undefined power whatever name you call should not be vested with any person including judiciary it must be defined you codify you codify and our constitution our uh, supreme court as well as the high court also have their own self restraint and they have codified in certain cases when this inherent power can be exercised that we will come later so there are some uh, quotations by cicero and uh, james madison and it's in the court our court in nagarajan was a state of karnataka justice is a virtue which transcends all barriers neither the rules of procedure nor technicalities of law can stand in its way this phrase was used by the honorable supreme court in a case where there was some uh, misrepresentation by the government regarding the quota of promoting certain persons in class c the brief facts of the case is something like this it goes like this see like any other political party a political party at karnataka offered 150 rupees dole to unemployed graduates they were uh, siphonary graduates they were called as siphonary graduates 150 rupees was given to them for some time later on they won the election and the, those persons started pressurizing them to give government job somebody advised them that is yes, we can accommodate them give them quota in class c post when we recruit we will uh, fix some quota 40 percent quota was given to them then some of them were accommodated few hundreds were not accommodated they came to court and they, when the court asked them what is that uh, why you are not you are given an assurance there is a quota why you are not uh, what is the vacancy position this and that government gave some uh, statistics supreme court said okay you accommodate them later on promoters were waiting for promotion and the others who are waiting some direct recruitment approached the court and said that see in our state we have only 600 to vacancy and if you are going to give all the 600 posts for this person siphonary graduates where will we go we will not get appointment will not get the promotion what is this then supreme court called for the records again then they said that there is some mistake given uh, and the data given by the kannada uh, government is wrong so we have been misled we want to correct it so whatever it is we are Yeah, exercising our inner and power, and in that context, that context, they want to undo the wrong done by the court due to the mistaken information given by the government. So they said, justice is virtue which transcends all barriers, neither the rules of procedure nor technicalities of law can stand in the way. And as I said, this word justice been understood, misunderstood, or misapplied, applied wrongly, rightly. Uh, uh, on various occasions and uh, they we, we call it as natural justice justice of uh, as per law balancing justice these are all words used by the supreme court and some of the foreign judges this balancing justice justice by mercy natural justice so on so forth so here the whole confusion arises and that is why the co conflict also is there and uh, now as far as our country is concerned the inherent power we can trace it from the constitution we will start with the constitution so article 142 speaks about inherent power of the supreme court but only one a part of that article we read or apply it has lot of uh, limitations in article 142 itself if you read article 142 you will understand that it is not that easy for supreme court to say anything that i have an inherent power and i will do this and uh, article 141 whatever said by the supreme court is law and uh, it will fit under the definition of article 132 it is not so it has very much limitation in built in that article itself and if you read the other articles in the constitution like 138 139 140 you will understand that it is not as if that supreme court can say anything and do anything whether said in the law or contrary to the law uh, statute it is not so and that is the reason why for nearly 30 years powers under 142 was not much exploited by the supreme court they were very conscious of that fact but half late uh, at least one in 10 cases they used this they they have now started uh, dictating the high court also yes we want a pan india criminal law procedure we want pan india box act we want to ban whatever 
even the state has the public jurisdiction as per the constitution. They say that yes, you do that and they issue. That also will come. It directly affects the bar. <laughs> Those two <laughs> judgments, that's why I want to tell you. Yes. Now, if you read Article 138, it confers power to the Supreme Court to enlarge its jurisdiction. And that power also is, has some limitation, I'll tell later. 139, conferment on the Supreme Court of power to issue writs for the purpose, for any purpose other than Article 32. To. What is other than Article 32, Supreme Court can issue writ, but that power has to be conferred by the parliament. That will come later. And one for 40 is the ancillary power of the Supreme Court. Certain powers are given to the Supreme Court already under the constitution. And if necessary, some ancillary power must be given to the constitution that else can also be conferred, but all only through a legislation. It is not the Supreme Court itself can take it. Now, th that's the precondition. As far as 138 is concerned, Parliament, as may by law confer, further jurisdiction can be given to them. Likewise, in 138, the phrase used is Parliament may by law confer on Supreme Court to issue writs other than what's prescribed or mentioned in 32.3. Parliament may by law make provision for conferring supplementary powers to enable Supreme Court more effectively to exercise the jurisdiction conferred on it. So, these are all condition precedent which required to enlarge the jurisdiction or confer more power under the jurisdiction or give some ancillary power to the Supreme Court. Only then 142 comes. Now this 141 and 13 2 I have just want to bring to your uh, attention is that this 141 says law declared by Supreme Court is binding on all courts. So whatever they say as a law binding on them. But what is law is defined in the constitution itself. It does not say what Supreme Court is law. What say what Supreme Court says is law. It, it only says what is already enacted pre uh, constitution period and not inconsistent to the fund of part 3 and what is to be enacted not inconsistent to part 3 or alone law. Now we have to read harmoniously 141 and 13 2 and take that what Supreme Court says is a law until Parliament passes a law in the manner known to law. So it can be only for a temporary period. For example, I can say this Vikasa. It is a classic uh, example which we can easily understand. There is a vacuum, there is no legislation. Society requires a controlling law or a mechanism to prevent abuse of women folk in working station. So, they formulated guidelines and they expected the legislature to bring law, they have done it subsequently. So, that is the purpose, the real purpose of conferring inherent power and say what Supreme Court says is a law is only for this, not where they already there is an existing law or where a law has been passed and you exercising your inherent power and say that no, this law is bad. If it is contrary to article part 3, if you say it is inconsistent, repugnance to the, then it is all right. But you cannot say that we have already made a law called collegium. Therefore, your legislation passed by 500 ml uh, um, representatives of the people is bad in law. I am very frank, I want to tell this. I want to record this. They cannot say that. And this is where there is some problem where we are not able to understand where we are leading. And we think that this, this inherent power exercised by the Supreme Court is right because they are choosing right persons to be judges. It is not the person, I do not know mechanism how they are selected, but the person who decides and selects matters. In 50s, we had a very good judge. There was no mechanism at all. There was no collegium system, nothing. Only this constitution. At that time, the constitution, they understood constitution as in consultation with Supreme Court means we will consult them, that all. Not predominance to consult uh, Supreme Court was not at all there. That itself is a judgment law. They said predominance first. Then they said, hey, we will recommend and you just endorse it. Then we said, no, 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 this is, we will follow our procedure. All right. For first 10 years, 15 years, it was very good. 
but it is not so later. And the legislation has been passed and that legislation is tested not under the provisions of other articles but under 142 they are exercising and say that this is this and this is the where our uh, area where we have to ponder. So, this 142 Supreme Court in excess of its jurisdiction may pass such degree or make such order as is necessary for doing complete justice in any cause or matter pending before it. Also such degree or order made by Supreme Court will be enforceable all over the territory of India. If you want to uh, give a restricted meaning to this, you can understand that this power is to enforce its degree or order if there is some vacuum or lacuna, Supreme Court can rise up to the occasion to that case. And in fact, I, I, I used to feel that this 142 must be on a case to case basis. To the rendering complete justice means there cannot be a, a judgment in rem and say that this judgment in rem is uh, for to give complete justice. It is very difficult. In particular case and particular facts and circumstances, we may be forced to bend or deviate from the existing law to give complete justice. But we cannot apply that judgment or that precedent in all cases. So for example, at one point of time, this moratorium period of <coughs> 6 months for a concerned diverse 13 B, it was simply waived by the trial court itself at one point of time. Later on, there was some, no, it, it is non-negotiable, it cannot be done. Then they waited. And the Supreme Court made, uh, in some cases, they exercise 142 and they did it. But in such cases, this inherent power is required because we know that there are some spouses who are, who are fighting for 10 years, 15 years and later on, they will realize that, yes, we will, without clubbing each other, we will go for mutual divorce. They will file it and they want a degree immediately. But how the purpose of six month schooling period is that so that they will change their mind and come back. But a person who has already waited for 15 years, they had no chance of uh, reconsidering their breakdown. Six months or even six years is not going to help. Here, to do a complete justice or to meet the ends of justice, this waiver must be done. But in some cases, when it is done, it was questioned. In some cases, when it was not done, it was questioned. And they said that complete justice is only our prerogative. You do not have <laughs> power at all. This is how they say. And uh, the same thing, we can also uh, take some examples, uh, incidents in the uh, 138 NA Act, this compromise, compounding the offence. There was uh, 147 was inserted only in 2002, that Act came in 1988 amendment. And uh, this, after fighting for some time, up to Supreme Court also, then the parties used to avoid imprisonment, they used to uh, seek for uh, compounding. But there was no provision. Some court exercised 320 and they said, yes, compounding is, uh, the court can be applied in all offenses we are applying. But in some cases, uh, the, because Supreme Court itself in one judgment uh, in 1963 or so, when a tribunal, central exercise tribunal or customs tribunal grant a cigar gra granted an interim stay, that was challenged and they said that in your act there is no provision for granting ex parte interim stay. You are granted ex parte interim stay. You can't do it only. Those things are only vested with us. Tribunal has no power because the act does not provide for that. So likewise, this uh, compounding also, there was an issue. Some, uh, some were very hesitant. They said that how there is no power for us. And even now, even I have some hesitation in cases like 138. After disposal, they ask us to review the matter. We want to compound it. But then come. In CRPC, there is no provision at all to uh, review the matter, like, unlike CPC, there is no provision. But in some case, we know that this matter requires review, but we can't do it. In that case, we have to exercise our inherent power. That is really where the exercise of this inherent power is required, but uh, it is not available in all statutes or in all uh, circumstances. This is one thing. Now, <coughs> This is what I was just discussing. The power under Article 142 can be exercised in, the, in absence of legislation to fill the lacuna or even in spite of legislation which says this is the law, you can break it 
not bend it, you can break it and say no, we will do it to meet the ends of justice. This is the scope of 142. But when we do it, to whom we are going to do it and whom we have done so far is the matter. So there are some instances where there is no, in the absence of legislation, Supreme Court has come out with some good guidelines, suggestions and that has been also implemented by the legislators. Like uh, as I said, this Vishaga case, compounding of NIFNs and uh, this Madhuri Patil case also. In Madhuri Patil case, there was some issue regarding the uh, 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 giving a, a ACSC certificate, there was a lot of confusion. Everybody used to say, I am Konda ready. Uh, whether they are ready or not, they will say, I am Konda ready and get a certificate. And uh, the, the, the revenue authority people will say, uh, this Konda ready, Konda means uh, uh, mountain and this, uh, this community is in Tamil Nadu in only some pockets. That statistics is found uh, when the uh, census taken by the British period in 1911, but uh, in after, uh, <laughs> particularly after <laughs> 1980, in Tamil Nadu there was, uh, in every state, every village where there is no radiar at all, there will be some Konda Reddy certificate. <laughs> and that became a great racket. It's all a menace of the thing and we, uh, we don't, we can't find fault with the persons because when there is an opportunity, and there is some uh, something can be done and get that avail that opportunity people is ready to go and get it we can't find fault with them and uh, in a way they are also persons deserve that concession maybe they may not belong to the community but they deserve that concession they are not falling under the criteria what prescribed by the government so they try to squeeze themselves and fit into it that's all so at that point of time when this became a racket supreme court said that no form a state level committee, form a district level committee, all those things. Then legislations came. So these are all something where courts are ahead of legislatures. Normally society will be ahead of legislatures, then legislation will come. And uh, there, that legislation will be interpreted by the courts, but sometimes it will be uh, other way around also. <coughs> so now the real question is, whether the power under one article 142, the inherent power is unfettered one. There are two school of thoughts. One say it is unfettered. Another say no, no. It is subject to the legislation. So let us see how the march of law in this aspect. <coughs> so the, the, the nagging question is that whether constitutional provision under article 142 could override express statutory provisions. Different views at different point of time being expressed by the Supreme Court and some of the uh, uh, cases, few cases due to paucity of time, I will mention few cases and what they have said. Then we will go to the code. An order, this is Prem Chandkar, was Center, uh, Excise Commissioner, UP, 1963. An order which this court can make in order to do complete justice between the parties must not only be consistent with the fundamental rights guaranteed by the constitution, but it cannot even be inconsistent with the substantive provisions of the relevant statutory law. So this was the extreme strict view that even uh, it is more stricter than saying it can be sparingly used. You can exercise this, but only within the framework of the legislature which is already in existence, you can't transcribe. That is in 1963, that was almost followed till Anthule case. In Anthule RS Nayak case, 88, however wide the plenary, the language of the article, the directions given by the court should not be inconsistent with, repugnant to, or in violation of the specific provision of any statute. So, for, for some time they were following this, within three years in Union Carbide case, it warranted that warranted and took a small deviation and the court said it is necessary to set at rest certain misconceptions in the arguments touching the scope of the powers of this court under article 142 one of the concession because uh, by that time itself there was lot of hue and cry uh, changes or no changes it will always be there well, whatever be the subject so in 91 this, uh, this uh, uh, issue has boiled down to the level that it, it, it has become a very, very 
um, disturbing question for the Supreme Court whether to exercise this or not, exercise 142 or not. Then because many were eager to cross the Lakshmana Rega and exercise the power because the taste of power is such a uh, powerful. And uh, they also have felt that no, we can't wait for all this procedure and other thing. Uh, this is the law, this is the uh, result we have to give to them. Why we should wait for procedure? They will render now itself instant justice. So, so it is necessary to set at rest certain misconceptions in the arguments touching the scope of the power. So they started their conclusion with this uh, preamble. We want to set at rest the misconception. So they, are inter they, are, uh, they have decided that you, uh, your power is only within the framework of legislation. It is a misconception. So we want to set at rest and now these issues are matters of serious public importance. The proposition <coughs> that a provision in any ordinary law irrespective of the importance of the public policy on which it is founded operates to limit the powers of apex court under 142.1 is unsound and erroneous. So, they declared that the public policy will bond the existing statute and the power of the apex court cannot be fitted within the limits of the statute existing. If anybody say like that, it is unsound and erroneous. So we can play outside the boundary also. That is their uh, declaration in that judgment. So the power under Article 142 is at an ether entirely different level and often different quality. Prohibitions or limitations or provisions containing in ordinary law cannot ipso facto act as prohibitions of limitations on the constitutional power of Article 142. They again reiterate it. Such prohibitions or limitations in the statutes might embody and reflect the scheme of a particular law taking into account the nature and status of the authority of, of the court for the court on which conferment of powers limited in some appropriate way is contemplated. The limitations may not necessarily reflect or be based on any fundamental consideration of public policy. They, uh, they, they give predominance to the public policy and public interest at large. <coughs> and they said that your statute will be sent to backburn and uh, all public policy must be given. That is, uh, it is a progressive view. It's a progressive view. Then again, what is that public policy? Whether the policy taken by the uh, parliamentarian or the party in power is the public policy or else is again a question. Which line they, are, they want to favor uh, to exercise their inherent power is another question. It all depends upon as he uh, put as a rider in the beginning itself. It is for the judiciary to exercise his power or uh, wisdom properly and uh, take a decision. So, in exercising power under Article 142 and in assessing the need of complete justice of uh, accused of matter, the Apex Court will take note of the express prohibition in any substantive statutory provision based on some fundamental principle of public policy and regulate the exercise of its power and discretion accordingly. The proposition does not relate to the powers of the court under Article 142 but only to what is or not complete justice of a cause or matter and in the ultimate analysis of the propriety of the excess of the power. No question of lack of jurisdiction or of nullity can rise. So they, uh, the Supreme Court was very clear in that judgment that leave alone all the statutes, all the limitations, all public policy, whatever it is. To do complete justice, it is our discretion and our wisdom. We will exercise our own self restraint and wherever necessary we will do it. We will not look into the other aspects, limitations or whatever uh, propositions laid down. We will see the purpose of the legislation, whether that legislation is sufficient to render justice. If it is not sufficient, we will supplement our own reasoning, our own procedure and we will give complete justice. And Union uh, Carpet case, you know that this Bhopal tragedy and uh, therefore in such cases court has to take such a strong view or else when 5,000, 50,000 persons are affected and uh, the offender, uh, the polluter is a multinational company whom we can't reach uh, uh, so easily, 
and the local courts it's very difficult in fact uh, i have to confess our government went to america and said that our courts are not competent to the, uh, deal this case so you please deal the case and give compensation they quoted our good judgments and said that you have a very robust judiciary what is that you are representing you, that your uh, court is not competent to decide all these cases no no we know about your uh, quality of your judges and quality of your court go there we will do that or uh, we one thing we will direct the offender to deposit this much of dollars some huge money was uh, uh, fixed asked them they asked union corporate to deposit it and ask them to go and agitate the cause in indian court that is how it has happened and the next case which i am going to say is a more interesting case it is supreme court bar association versus union of india now in this case a person was a lawyer was found committing misconduct punishment was imposed and he was debarred from the uh, from practicing for few years this was done by the court in exercising the power under contempt of court act right? and he said that debarring me is the prerogative of the bar council under the advocates act you don't have any power here how can you do it earlier a similar case when it came to before supreme court they said that no no we have power under 142 they can do it but in this case they deviated and they said no there are some limitations there are some limitations which we have to consider when the statute a special statute governs uh, a particular category of persons and it if it is a composite act which takes care of all aspects regularizing their conduct punishing their misconduct and everything we can just like that usurp our power and exercise 142 and do it in that context they said it must be remembered that wider the amplitude of its power under 142 the greater is the need of care for this core to see that the power is used with restraint without pushing back the limits of the constitution so as to function within the bounds of its own jurisdiction to the extent this court makes the statutory authorities and other organs of the state perform their duties in accordance with law its role is unexceptionally but it is not permissible for the court to take over the role of the statutory bodies or other organ of the state and perform their functions here the real sense of judicial restraint been expressed then explicitly they have recorded that see each organ has its own role we have to allow them to function we can we can have a supervisory authority or to test their action at a different context but we can't take their role by itself for example in this case if the bar council has taken an action against that advocate and that is been tested we can use our jurisdiction and test it. but we ourselves cannot usurp the power of the bar council and say no i am debarring you 3 years i am doing this for 5 years i am putting you in 6 years jail that is they cannot do it that is what supreme court has rightly pointed out and said that every organ has its own role power and limitations allow them to function they have to function they have to take decision then if there is any error in the decision mistake in the decision making or in the reasoning given by them you can have a, a, a appellate jurisdiction or a supervisory jurisdiction there is no doubt that it is an indispensable adjunct to all other powers and is free from the restraint of jurisdiction and operation as a valuable weapon in the hands of the court to prevent clogging or obstruction of the stream of justice this is the exact clear intention and the expression which is now required for everybody the clogging and or obstruction of the stream of justice only to that extent we have to exercise our inner and power <coughs> however it need to be remembered that powers conferred under article 142 being curative in nature cannot be construed as powers which authorizes the court to ignore the substantive rights of a litigant while dealing with a cause pending before it this power cannot be used substantive law applicable to the case or cause under consideration of the court article 142 even with the width of its amplitude cannot be used to build a new edifice where none exists earlier by ignoring express statutory provisions dealing with a subject and thereby to achieve something indirectly which cannot be achieved directly 
I stop with this comment of the Supreme Court in the Supreme Court Bar Council as far as constitution is concerned. Now, their idea and view is very clear from this particular expression. All right. Now, a small deviation, which is now, as I said, I will talk about this regarding the conferment of senior counsels. That's the reason why I have decided to put these questions and make it uh, public because we have silence of good people is more tyranny. And uh, society expects lawyers to rise to occasion because our predecessors have demonstrated that we will save the democracy and we will achieve independence. These are all our forefathers uh, did. But I don't know how far uh, that fits to us. <laughs> But still I hope that we have some elements who will fit that bill. Now, this very same judgment which says Advocates Act will take care of the misconduct of the person applies to our Supreme Court conferment of senior counsel also. Because the judges, our advocates are classified into senior advocates and ordinary advocates only by virtue of the provisions under the Advocates Act. And the conferment of senior counsel designation is by the High Court, concern High Court. I do not know how Indra Jai Singh can ask the Supreme Court to frame a pan-India legislation by the Supreme Court and Supreme Court can frame a guidelines and ask High Court to do this. You have to frame this, you have to do this, you have to do that. We are, we are choosing our advocates, we know what must be their experience, what must be their qualification, how they must be selected. And they are, they are the index of our High Court. If Mr. X from this High Court wearing senior counsel gown and appear before some other state High Court or Supreme Court, the judges and the other persons who hear his representation and argument must ask from where he is coming, oh, he is from Madras High Court, yes. That's the quality of Madras High Court. So we have to send our ambassadors in such a way that they hold the flag of our High Court high. So we know whom we should confer. But they say that this is the guidelines you go, go and enact. If we say that no, we have the, the, this is the difficulty, we want a higher standard, no, no, nothing doing. This is how, they think that it is something like uh, AACT fixing a norm for admitting a student in engineering college. It's really, that's the very same analogy they have done. When AACT said 45 percent is sufficient to uh, admit in engineering college, some good reputed institution said that no, I need only students who have secured not less than 60 percent. That was telling that, that no, 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 you can, you have to admit 45 percent student also. So this is how, uh, that I will leave it there. And now this matter is now lingering around and touches your uh, interest. So uh, we will uh, now pass on to the code. It's already 620. <laughs> I will other quote. First, uh, CPC in short. This is where we more frequently when we enter the bar also, yeah, our seniors will say, uh, Sir, in the section, sir, on the white and the judge, Katara, adjournment, petition board in Jolra. One ritual board. Adjournment got provision. And the other number of customers, then you adjournment board, one ritual board. The judging on the adjournment petition put in Kaker the Gadia, the Ursula Matta Kapanga. Apodana Nepome, Kaper Kaker of Vadia and the Kona or Namaka. And a Pinati poet of Purgana Mutiri on the Vadia Rose, Nalan Panir Karen. I'm wearing now a retail poet to Baban Murikar the Vada or Amik is classly old and a bloody chot, Titia, Kelly get a homework put in Darna. Number the Katanur Kumbodan of Pora at the Lavolga there, Solo. In the 151, the server is not going to be able to get the CPC. What do you do? 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 See, when judges were very judicious, in the section of the day, judges now, particularly on the one, Nayavadi, 
பிரச்சனைகள் வந்து அவன்கிட்ட வரும்போது ஊரில் பஞ்சாயத்துலேயே எங்கே வந்தான் அவனால் வந்து எந்த சட்டம் எதுவுமே இல்லைனாலும் அவனுடைய இயல்பாக அவன் வாழ்க்கையில் இருக்கக்கூடிய அனுபவங்களை கொண்டோம் அவன் நியாயம் செய்யணுன்ற எண்ணம் இருக்கும்போது அவனுக்கு தோன்ற யுத்திகள் சாலமன்னெல்லாம் நம்ம பெருமையாக பேசுகிறோம்னா அவனுக்கு வந்து அவன் யோசித்து வச்சுருந்துருப்பானா ஒரு குழந்தைய ரெண்டு அம்மா அங்கே சட்டை போடுவாங்க அர்த்தம் கொடுக்குறேன்னு சொன்னால் உண்மையான தாய் எடுத்துப்பானோ யோசிச்சுருப்பானோ பண்ணியிருக்க மாட்டான் அவனுக்கு ஆனால் நியாயம் செய்யணுன்ற எண்ணம் அவன் புத்தியில் மனசில் எப்பயுமே ஊறி இருந்ததுனால ஓனு கத்தினா ரெண்டு பேர் வரும்போது அவன் உடனே என்ன சொல்கிறான் யோசித்தான் அந்த நிமிஷம் சரி உண்மையான தாய் இதில் தெரிஞ்சிடும் கட் பண்ணி கொடுத்துருங்க ஆளுக்கு பாதி எடுத்து போங்க அப்படின்னு பெத்தவ துடிக்கிறா ஐயோ வேணாம் அவளே வந்து கொள்ளவிட்டோம் குழந்த அவன் அடிச்சு இது பண்ணியிருந்தா கூட பண்ண கொள்ள வேண்டாமேன்னு அவன் சொல்கிறான் உண்மை தாய் தெரிஞ்சு போகுது எந்த பூ நல்ல பூன்னு கேட்குறாங்க எது ஒரிஜினல் எது டூப்ளிகேட்னு கேட்குறாங்க அவனை எனக்கு நம்மளாம் யாரா கேட்பான் பத்து வருஷம் பொறுத்து நம்ம இப்போ படிச்சு வச்சுக்கலாம் நான் வச்சுட்டு இருந்தான் கிடையாது அவனுக்கு வந்து கரெக்டாக நியாயம் செய்யணுன்ற அந்த எண்ணம் இருந்தால் அந்த அந்த யுத்தி வந்துடும் அந்த ஒரு அந்த நேரத்தில் அந்த கணத்தில் அந்த யோசனை வரும் இது இயல்பாக வரக்கூடியது அனுபவத்தால் நான் சொல்லிக்கிட்டேன் பல நீதிவான்கள் நல்ல தீர்ப்புகள் எழுதியிருக்கிறார்கள் என்றால் அவர்கள் மெத்த படித்தவர்கள் அழகாக ஆங்கிலம் பேசக்கூடியவர்கள் உலகத்தில் உள்ள அனைத்து புத்தகங்களும் படித்தவர்கள் அல்ல அவர்கள் மனதளவில் நெஞ்சளவில் நல்ல தீர்ப்பை ஒழுங்காக தர வேண்டும் நாம் சொல்லுகின்ற தீர்ப்பை எவரையும் பாதகமாக கூடாது தவறான நபர்களை தண்டிக்க கூடாது என்ற உள்ளுணர்வோடு இருக்கின்ற நீதிவான்களின் தீர்ப்புகள் சிறப்பாக இருந்திருக்கிறது இதுதான் உண்மை அதனால தான் பூ வந்து இப்போ ஒரிஜினல் பூவா டூப்ளிகேட் பூவான எப்படி பார்த்தா கது தரடான்றான் தோட்டத்தில் வந்து வருது ஹனி பீஸ் தட் இஸ் வாட் தட் புக் ஹனி பீஸ் ஆஃப் சாலமன் ரிட்டன் பை கேட்டி தாமஸ் ஸோ இஎஸ் நெரேட்டர் ஹவு திஸ் ஹஸ் ஹேப்பன் தட் இஸ் ரீசன் வை ஆம் டெலிங் திஸ் சி திஸ் இஸ் ஆல் திஸ் வேர்ட் ஜஸ்டிஸ் இஸ் தி பிரைம் திங் அண்ட் வாட் இஸ் ஜஸ்டிஸ் இஸ் வாட் வி பர்சீவ் so to meet the tense of justice to give a complete justice power is being given to us it can be used to misuse or abuse it is all left with the concerned judges and in my opinion any judgment rendered under 142 of the constitution it we must construe that it it is for that case for facts of that case we can't fit that to all other cases this will be more helpful and it will be give really that will render more uh, better justice or is that may lead to injustice if you are going to apply a judgment which is not fit with in any of the legislation but excise under 142 to all other cases that may be in danger this is regarding <coughs> now 152 and is talking about 151 this inherent power is really uh, it's power which is conferred to all courts unlike 142 to the uh, supreme court or 482 to the high court 151 is a wider power given to all courts and it has a meaning the code of procedure if you look into it the number of sections number of orders number of rules and practically the difficulty which every litigant face requires such inherent power if that inherent power is not vested with the court the court delay will be more enormous therefore this is the one provision which really saves our indian judiciary just imagine if 151 is not there in the code of civil procedure how much delay it will cause if a section returns your paper for compliance of certain returns you receive it 10 days time limitation it is written by the represent back you exit for 2 years you don't take it then you file it no provision on the limitation act will help you unless 151 is invoked so this is one piece of evidence i'm telling that how uh, 151 saves our judiciary and civil litigations so nothing in this code shall be deemed to limit or otherwise affect the inherent powers of the court to make such orders as may be necessary for the ends of justice or to prevent abuse of process of court so these are the two riders under 151 the limitation for 151 inherent power of a civil court is these these two limitations so 151 when court can exercise power under section 151 this is all just uh, uh, so thing section 151 does not confer a new power to the court 
but makes a statutory recognition of inherent power of the court to do certain things is debito justice. The inherent power can be involved only for the attainment of the ends of the substantial justice. Section 151 provides only an extraordinary procedure and action under this section. It is not in any sense obligatory. It is not an obligatory one, it is a mandatory one. Section 151 could only be involved where no other remedy is available. This is one rider. So, when there is uh, order 17 is there, you should not file adjournment petition under uh, 151. That is what they say. So, when there is a specific provision, you do that. The, and uh, the, when there is a specific supplementary power under 94, you excise that and say, do not, you just search CPC, you will find out the remedy is available in some other provision itself, expressly they have provided it. Unless and until there is no such thing, you resort to 151. That is all. So, 151 could only be involved where no other remedy is available. It does not confer any substantive right on parties, but it only meant to get over the difficulties arising from rules of justice. So, the two major principles involved for invoking 151 is, there are two major principles. The court must take into consideration while exercising its inherent power. The first being that the power are to be exercised only for the ends of justice. And second, it should be to prevent abuse of process of court. Such power must not be exercised when prohibited or excluded by the court or other statutes and in situation when there exist specific provisions in the court applicable to the litigation at hand. Now, Mullah, abuse of uh, what he said, this is some court that I will just keep it, it malicious improper use of some regular legal proceedings to obtain an unfair advantage over an oppo uh, opponent. So, what is uh, some illustration like? what is meant by abuse of power and ends of justice. So, this justice, the word, uh, this has been uh, emphasized because in my opinion, in my opinion, the term justice is the extent and limit for inherent power. So, how we are going to perceive and uh, the term justice in a given context matters. That depends upon the individual judges and not the later literatures or less and this will help us to get an idea but it all depends upon the individual cases that is what my opinion and I uh, will stop here so far as CPC is concerned I will ask madam how much time I can take for CRPC I huh? will take another 5 minutes or so I will complete it so it is already 6 30 now CRPC see this is in fact a uh, very a very helpful pro provision for practitioners of all high courts, all high courts wherever it is. And uh, our counterparts in Mufshal also enjoy this provision through us, through us. When I started practice in 1988, late 80s, I used to get postcard or letter or phone call from my counterpart at my lower native saying that, sir, uh, CC number or uh, NBW in the Chisar at the Vaida Tedi the recall for no only this much of information. So we used to file a petition 2 rupees stamp of OT uh, court fee what did it recall warrant uh, 482 to recall the warrant date so and so so on the next year date of hearing so and so 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 CC number that's all. Uh, in the cost list we will find some 60 or 70 cases in a criminal admission bench. Uh, at that time, Justice Ramlingam, uh, Justice Janathan, all judges, all judges, they will just, you know that. And they will say, item 60, the BC itself, court officer will say, item 60 to 120, NBW recall, recall. That's all. And, uh, and one fine day, uh, a judge like me, <laughs> was promoted from CADR, and then what is that? Warrant is issued under section 70. There is a provision in the 72 to recall it. Why you are 482? <laughs> so, he raised the issue. Um, uh, Justice Janathanam is a very good administrator, very strong in criminal law and also in civil law. He is very strong in, and he asked the bar to address. Yes, come on address. <laughs> and uh, we had nothing to say, say except 482 is plenary power, inherent power, inbuilt power, residuary power, 
we all survive out of that. When most of the juniors only depend on that, how can you, you uh, take it? He said nothing to it. Go there, file petition to recall, come back. Now that is the law. Then in between there was some slight dilution. Again it is reiterated now. The law is very clear now. And seventy and there is a specific provision. There is no necessity to invoke inherent power. This is one aspect of the story, one 482 story. But I will also tell the flip side of it. If that had been, in, been encouraged, if petition under 482 to recall the warrant being encouraged and continued, many of us would have not come out from that area. We would have been very satisfied with the money, 50 rupees, 100 rupees those days or 300 rupees, whatever it is, we would have been very satisfied. We would have not gone to the other provisions of CRPC. We would have stick on with 482 itself. And we would have filed some petition to recall warrant and some petition prohibition case those days we used to get some feeding. We would have filed and we would have kept quite that itself sufficient for a decent living. But because that door was shut, we started to find other green pastures and we learned that oh, 482 is nothing. There are other provisions we can, we can ask for quash, we can ask for uh, uh, many things. And uh, later on, this registering the complaint not to register the complaint. Then X will come and say, I have given a complaint against my husband. Police has not taken action. I, uh, direct the all police station to take action. Next day, husband will come and say, police is calling me, harassing me, not to harass. It's only a family dispute. Supreme Court has said, you should conduct all the uh, preliminary inquiry. 41A should be given. Nothing is given. They are calling me in the morning 7 o'clock. Till 9 o'clock, they are not allowing me to go out. Yes, not to harass. Then somehow there will be another petition saying under 482, register the complaint and file final report by the wife. Yes, register the complaint and final report. Ashwin will come and say, quash that complaint under 482. <laughs> All right. This is the sequence. This has reached a level which we are very much ashamed to see that today a case will come where I have uh, the admission stage, I would have said that. Yes, register the case. Tomorrow another uh, petition will come under 482 that the husband will say not to harass or stay the investigation. So then uh, bench sat and said that 482, the, all this register the complaint and other thing. There is a procedure. Take all those procedures. But at times we may feel that a very lucrative area has been taken away from us. It is not so. A person to cause a complaint, you can come at any time. To cost a FIR, you can come at any time, provided now Supreme Court has laid down the guidelines when 482 can be exercised for quashing a complaint or quashing an FIR. Bajan Lal case is the bedrock case. Before Bajan Lal, Kapoor case is there, and then Bajan Lal, they have laid down guidelines. Those guidelines clearly tells us when we can approach it. And many of our clients also know that a breathing time, breathing time so that they can compromise the matter or they can uh, settle the matter otherwise. Uh, likewise, they can ask us to file a petition. We also file, court also grants some relief. Depends upon the judges. <laughs> and that's how we going. But 482 has its own limitation. Well, then. The High Court has inherent powers and they have been given statutory recognition by enacting Section 482 of this court. This 482 uh, is there, was there in the world code also, 561A or something. It was there. So it is not that it was newly introduced in uh, the new code 1973. World code also had this and they were exercising that power and that was tested by the so high courts and federal courts at some occasions also. There are good judgments on that. At, but that time, exploiting this provision was less. But we, now we have more scope. When more legislations are there and uh, procedures are not so uh, complete. Naturally, 482 is the one panacea for us. And uh, uh, here I also want to register that our legislations of late for the past two decades, you can see that they are not uh, um, legislated or drafted from the persons, indigenous persons who know the nuances of the society or the crime. Uh, most of them are cut and copy based from the international conventions. I can quote n number of legislations where you will find that first three or four preamble definitely you can uh, say that it is not written by an Indian. 
the preamble will clearly say that it is a, 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 a foreign language man who has drafted it. They will just cut copy paste from the convention, put it as a preamble, object and as a, uh, subject of this uh, uh, legislation and some of the provisions will be like that and then one or two provisions they will take it from PC Act 1988 or prior to that 1952 and something like uh, conferment of special power, power to the special court, cognizance, all those things. These are the standard provisions. Then saving clause and uh, war, repeal and war. Only this, much, this will be indigenous. Other thing, uh, made in foreign, make in foreign, sell in foreign like that. <laughs> those provisions you can just see, I can quote any number of like even including Pokes Act. Have you ever heard of such uh, expressions like uh, uh, aggravated, penetrative, uh, sexual assault? Uh, 376 and 354 is sufficient. You can give the higher punishment, no problem. You, you by classifying all this thing, now the judges also feel difficult, prosecution agency also feel difficult, victim also will say difficult to say what has happened to her. Why harassment, assault, uh, this and that? So, they want to classify, <coughs> grade the uh, offence, not necessary, 354 will take care if we stick on to 354 and 376 and give sufficient punishment, that itself is enough. Alright, nothing in this court shall be deemed to limit or affect the inherent power of the High Court to make such orders as may be necessary to give effect to any order under the court or to prevent abuse of process of the court or otherwise to secure the ends of justice. Though these two riders is this, one is to prevent abuse of the process of any court and to secure the ends of justice. This is the um, key word in uh, ex uh, employed expressions employed under uh, in section 482 and this 482 uh, is really the savior of many injustice. If uh, exercising 482 uh, substantially injustice in this country been prevented and uh, it, uh, it has to be exercised in appropriate cases uh, though so Bajanlal says sparingly used yes we have to sparingly use but it should be used in the case where we are convinced that it is an abuse of process of law or it is not a case to be decided by a criminal court it is a civil dispute or malicious prosecution, all these things, uh, if you are convinced, necessarily 482 will be exercised. And some of the guidelines alone I will tell and I will complete my uh, lecture. Uh, the guidelines laid down by Bhajan Lal and in my opinion, this is a composite guidelines. All other judgments prior and later are all uh, same guidelines or few things added, couching the terminology in different way. But the spirit is one and the same. So, where the allegation made in the FIR or the complaint, even if they are taken at their face value and accepted in their entirety, do not prima facie constitute any offence or make out a case against the accused, a 482 to be exercised. So, when you draft a petition under 482 to quash, kindly see the first see these guidelines and in which category or case fall and then narrate the facts and tell all the material placed in the FIR or in the complaint and say that no, if this content is accepted as truth now itself, you can't punish me for this offence. That will be the better way of drafting your 482 petition so that the court will also be convinced to interfere or else without trial, acquitting a person or prejudging a person is not a fair justice system. You have to hear both the accused as well as the victim. But in case when the material, chattila unime illa, ana na adapram build up pani pan, na saachu guna andu gorpe, na talk kumanda kudu pan, the sillalam petitiono podo. Engita patti lachuru, engita, engon kudu gula pona, engon thitra, engon asima pesana, 294 attract agon, 506 patto attract agon, or kiran vara potu te, 307 engon material create pan doa. Adu 230. So, in the matters like this, so this you have to 
focus and highlight for uh, to convince the court. That is one thing I have to do. Next point. Where the allegation in the FIR and the other material, if any, accompanying the FIR do not disclose a cognizable offence. Justifying an investigation by police officers on 156.1, the court, except under an order of magistrate within the purview of 1553, then you can quash it, when it is not a cognizable offence. Therefore, a police cannot entertain such a complaint and uh, harass the uh, accused. Well, the uncontroverted allegation made in the FIR or complaint and the evidence collected in support of the same do not disclose the commission of any offence and make out a case against the FIR. That is very clear. Where the allegations in the FIR do not constitute a cognizable offence, but constitute only a non-cognizable offence. No investigation is permitted by police officer without an order of magistrate as contemplated on 155.2, this is a repetition, and, uh, but this has another small deviation. See, it will be a non-cognizable offence. There may be, no, it is not even an uh, offence, it is one category, an offence which is not cognizable but non-cognizable and there may be some complaints which can be taken cognizable only on a prior sanction or some, there will be some preconditions, but simply they will entertain the complaint. Police will entertain the complaint or uh, magistrate also sometimes entertain under 156, register the complaint and investigate uh, against the government servant and the allegations will be touching upon his uh, action while exercising the duty, uh, official duty, something like that, where uh, prior sanction is required and those cases also we have to say that this is not, the criminal law cannot be set into motion without complying the preconditions X, Y, Z. So, but the allegation was so absurd and inherently improbable, this is one thing where the skill of the advocates, absurd and inherently improbable, there will be a complaint. Reading the complaint will give an impression there is a prima facie case, cognitive case is made out, but the advocacy requires to impress upon the court when you approach uh, the high court under 482 that the content of the FAR or the complaint is so absurd and inherently improbable. This uh, requires some sort of research or common sense, that is all. If somebody, a uh, rickshaw wala says, I, I was carrying uh, 10 lakh of rupees in my rickshaw and this man wielded a knife and snatched away that money, I went to his house, he attacked me, this and that. Or a rickshaw wala says, X has given a check for me for the, my 10 lakh rupees for the money which has borrowed from me, therefore uh, 138 and something like that which is very absurd on the face of it by giving some other evidence saying that who is he, where is he, what is his work and I have given a complaint of loss of my check and that complaint is pending, missing check, complaint is pending. I travelled in the auto rickshaw and this man has stolen or he has somehow laid his hand in this bank check, he has now using this, something like that and with you, uh, if, if you are able to convince the court, it is only an illustration I am telling to, for easy understanding, if you are able to demonstrate before the court that it is highly improbable, highly improbable of NRI say that I have uh, given uh, 10 crore rupees to this man as an investment, he cheated me and if he is not able to produce any paper, how an NRI can transfer that money, at least you must say through Avala, something you must say. So, highly improbable. There are some cases which be very highly improbable and if you are able to demonstrate before the court that it is highly improbable, absurd, the 482 will be entertained. And when there is a legal bar engrafting in any provisions of court under which cannot be constituted, this is what I said, the previous sanction may be required in Food Adulteration Act and there are some other uh, special acts. Without that, these people will file without uh, getting the sanction they will file the complaint and then after uh, causing notice they will say that I have enclosed the sanction order along with the complaint but there will not be any whisper about it and that will also be not look into it, it will just cause notice. So these are cases where we can very well straight away we can seek for caution. And then the last one is <coughs> where a criminal proceeding is manifestly attended with malafide and where the proceedings is maliciously instituted with an ulterior motive for wreaking vengeance on the accused and which a view to spite him due to private and personal in this, this has been included in the Bajan Lal case in the given context. Bajan Lal 
there was lot of uh, cases criminal cases in, uh, he was former uh, um, uh, chief minister of haryana so uh, political vendetta there was lot of cases and that context they said that if it is manifestly malicious one you can come and uh, this mo only uh, most of the politicians can make use of it others say it's very difficult but this is also on ground there is if they are able to establish there are many cases get quashed on this ground so uh, that is all because of the uh, persons so now a very very interesting quote by singapore supreme court about the inherent power i at the beginning itself i said that this is not a nagging problem for us alone it's a universal one and some courts are very uh, um, conscious of this and they want to uh, restrict it and uh, some think that it is a, it's a god given uh, fortune or some boon to us we will exercise left right center what what may come this is all the attitude of individuals now uh, in singapore supreme court has said this inherent power should not be used as to it were the joker in the pack of cards possessed of no specific des uh, designation and used only when one did not have the specific card required so don't use uh, uh, inherent power like that that's it and uh, so my view is this inherent power not to be invoked as a shortcut route to get redress if the court over exploit this power the rule of law will get sabotage inherent power is like an emergency lamp it should be used only in case of darkness and not during day time or when you have alternate energy source either conventional or non conventional thank you very much thank you much for your valuable lecture series we feel immense pressure today since we have gained a part of knowledge from the ocean of knowledge the more that you read the more things you will know today a reader tomorrow a leader so one of our senior advocate mr sanitary sir contributing pollen silver and uh, some law books to our association may i request our librarian mrs padahari madam to receive the book from our honorable justice mr dr g j chandran may i request mr samitri sir on stage No person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been rewarded for what he gave. May I request our Vice President, Mrs. Maria Vaiana Madam, to honor our Honorable Justice, Dr. Mr. G. J. Chandran, with a memento as a token of respect and love. Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. May I request our secretary, Mrs. P. Krishnaveni, to deliver oath of thanks. Before we wind up, a few words of warmth. Good evening to all. Honorable Mr. Justice Dr. G. J. Chandran J. Honorable Mr. Justice Sundar Mohan J. Honorable Mrs. Uh, Justice N. Mala J. Senior Advocate, Madam N. Krishnaveni, ma'am. Senior Counsel, Isaac Mohan Lad, sir. senior armugam sir law commission member mr m karnanidhi sir advocate parkodi karnan lakshmi gopinath ma'am mr sami dara sir advocate ji karb sami sir and uh, president and secretaries of various bar p andi raj sir president mbha s srinivas raghavan sir president mmba r venkateshan sir secretary mba D Anbar as uh, secretary MBHA, Vinod, convener MMBA, members of legal fraternity, especially junior members of bar. Good evening to all. It is my privilege to propose vote of thanks on behalf of WAA. I extend my sincere gratitude to Honorable Mr. Justice Dr. G. J. Chandran J. 
and other companion judges who have graced this occasion in spite of in spite of their hectic uh, schedule and made this lecture a grand success thank you judge i am happy that uh, being a criminal side practitioner the first lecture itself after i became secretary of this association has started with criminal side lecture today we had the most purposeful function that uh, honorable mr justice dr g jayachandran j gave uh, an address on the topic of inherent powers it, its extent and limitation we gathered a lot of knowledge about inherent powers its extent and limitation by this lecture judge thank you judge we will convene such meeting often for the academic benefit of the advocates i extend my heartfelt gratitude to the honorable judges who have graced this occasion thank you lordship we are indeed proud to have you judge i extend my thanks to all the advocates who have gathered here and i uh, i extend my special thanks to mr g karuswami pandyan sir who is sitting back here <coughs> i extend my thanks to all the advocates who have gathered here and a special thanks to women advocates who are present present in large number i extend my hearty thanks to president ma'am the anandali ma'am for organizing such a wonderful lecture series ma'am thank you ma'am i once again extend my heartfelt thanks to press staff of wa i thanks to one and all thank you happy new year to all thank you now i request mrs shakila and bala minakshi to come on stage to sing the national anthem and i request everyone to stand for national anthem hain man adinayak jaye hi bharat bhagya vidada punjab sindh gujarat maratha dravid utkal vanga vind himachal yamuna ganga उच्चल जलति तरंगा दव शुभ नामे जागे दव शुभ आशीष मागे कागे दव जय गादा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विदादा जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 